My name is Eloise Schottler. I'm a storyteller. So what else would you expect? I'm going to tell you a story. <laughs> <laughs> One afternoon, I left my house in Chevy Chase to make a quick trip to a shopping center, and the universe dropped a story into my lap. I was driving along a two-lane narrow road, and I looked up and I was trapped behind a rickety panel truck. I was going so slow that all I could do was take that inventory. The back of that truck was filled with household goods, cardboard boxes that had just been tossed in. They weren't even sealed. Carpets standing up, rolled up, standing at the back. He hit a rut in the road, and I heard something hit the asphalt right in front of me. I was going so slow that I saw the photograph album laying there. It took me a lot of trouble to get my family photos for my family history. I couldn't ignore that. I moved up as close as I could to the truck. I waved out the window. I honked my horn. Couldn't pass on the right, couldn't pass on the left. I was feeling a little desperate, so I was relieved when he pulled over into a gas station. I pulled over right behind him, right up beside the cab of that truck. Hey, hey! A man stuck his head out of the window. What's the matter with you, lady? What do you want? I just want to tell you that you dropped something in the road. It's a photograph album. It don't matter. It don't matter. A 93-year-old woman just died. Nobody wants that stuff. I'm taking it to the dump. I wanted it. I turned right around and went back down that road. And there it was, laying in the road, just where I had last seen it. I waited for the traffic to clear. And I re got out, picked it up. It was what I expected it would be. It was a black cardboard cover, black pages. My aunt had a dozen of these down in Charlotte, North Carolina. I had seen little white, black and white photographs like this all my life. I looked through it. Young people near water and boats, vacation, laughing, talking with each other. They look so happy. And on every page, there's a picture with a pretty, white-haired, dark-haired woman on every page. I think that's the 93-year-old woman that just died. Nowhere, nowhere in here, there's no name. There's no name and there's no story. She's left to my imagination. That happened 20 years ago. And I've kept this album, it's very precious to me. And I often take it out and I look at those photographs and I wonder about her. I wonder about her. She stands so straight and so confident. She has a smiling look on her face. She's wearing a white slacks, those wide leg slacks of the 40s and a tailored shirt to go with it. She's put a captain's hat rakishly on her dark hair. She reminds me so much of those 1940s sassy women in the movies. A Rosalind Russell, a Katherine Hepburn. Maybe Sandra Bullock today, I don't know. But that's how I remember her. She looks like them to me, and I wonder about her. She reminds me of my aunts, actually. She's a contemporary of theirs. They wore the same kind of clothing. They had that same air about them, the sassy 1940s. 
young 20-year-old. Now, the oddity about this whole thing is that I don't have a name for her, I don't have a story for her, but oddly enough, the album now has a story. Because for 20 years, I've been telling the story of this album coast to coast when I tell stories for people. And they, like I, would worry about the woman. they come up to me after, they wonder who she had been. And I've had many people say to me, I'm going right home, and I'm putting a name on all of the <laughs> I hope that you're thinking the same thing. And I hope that hearing about her, you'll think about it if you don't have a story that you're telling about yourself. I think about my aunts, those North Carolina good talkers. I mean, they sat around, I was raised on their stories. They told stories all the time about themselves and each other. I had one of my aunts could go to the grocery store to get a loaf of bread, and by the time she got home, it was an epic. <laughs> I think of them often and I tell personal stories myself. And there are times, I have to tell you, when I hear their voices echo in my head in my own stories. And I'm very happy for that. I love those ladies. And I think we're all lucky when we grow up around stories. Where do we storytellers get our stuff? I'll tell you where mine comes from because I tell personal stories. So I tell from the family. I tell from people I've known. And I look for them in new people. If I see somebody that interests me or something that's going on, I'm just as likely to intrude upon them and ask for their story as anything else. And I'm never disappointed and the major thing is that people like to be asked for their story. They like to tell you. One of the stories that I tell these days, I asked for in a doctor's office. I was sitting in the reception room waiting. And I looked over, and sitting across from me was a youngish man. He was wearing a t-shirt with the shirts pulled, sleeves pulled out at the shoulder. But he had the most beautiful skin. It was multicolored. It was tattooed from the edge of that shirt down to his wrist like it was sleeves of a shirt. I kept sneaking little looks to see if I could get closer. I wanted to see that. It looked like fabric. And finally, out of my mouth came this blurt. Can I please ask you about your tattoos? <laughs> sure, lady, I'll tell you about my tattoos. I'll be glad to. But before I can tell you about my tattoos, I have to tell you how I lost my leg. <laughs> to tell you the truth, I had never noticed <laughs> that he only had one half of his right leg that had slipped by me altogether. And I realized that was the price for hearing about the tattoos. <laughs> so I sat back and he told me a wild and woolly story that ended with a double amputee vet sitting on his Harley at the Vietnam Wall, waiting for rolling thunder. Can I tell your story? I'm a storyteller. I got to know your story. Can I tell it to other people? Sure, go ahead. Just one thing. My name is David. Tell him that, too. And I do. I think we can count on the truth of the fact that people are interested in having a story, in having a story that they can tell or at least knowing the story of who they are and where they come from. Isn't this sort of clear when you've got a series for several years on genealogy, on national television, and experts are looking up the family story for folks? 
When StoryCorps rolls into town on their movable sound recording studio, people sign up and they go because they want to tell their story. We all want to be remembered. We all want to be remembered. Memoir classes are filled. Go to any bookstore and the shelves are crowded with books, thick and thin, of people who've written down their stories because they want their families to know them, they want other people to know them, they want some way to leave a legacy. The storytelling that I do, I like to think of as oral <coughs> memoir. Don't worry, you don't have a book to buy from me. You know, that I think I give you my stories oral. And in my career life, which has been a while, in my career life, I've had several metamorphoses. And I include those in my story. I have one one-woman show, Pushing Boundaries. It's a story of personal survival and women's history. My daughter, youngest child, died 47 years ago. And to recover from that, I went back to college. Makes sense, doesn't it? I went back to college. I joined the women's movement of the 1970s. I earned an MFA in painting and I took a role on the national scene for the Equal Rights Amendment, for the Equal Rights Amendment campaign. And like so many others in that period and in all periods, history touched my life and I was an eyewitness. And so I have that in my story. I think we all want to connect with some point in time in history Look at last month, November, where when the media was full of small and long reminiscences of where people were in 1963 when John F. Kennedy was shot. There's a need 50 years later to position yourself in history when that horrible thing happened in this country. I have a new story that I'm telling, a new memoir. When my daughter died 47 years ago, she was buried at Arlington National Cemetery. In 2012, my husband joined her in what was his grave. And I know that when the time comes, I'll be buried right there with them. But that's not today. <laughs> Not today. Today I'm telling a new memoir story, and it's called Arlington National Cemetery, My Forever Home. And through that story, I'm healing, and by looking out at the world, that world around me at Arlington, I'm finding new stories there. I'm meeting people I would never have met in any other way but to be there as I am every week. And I've come to a new and very deep appreciation of the human cost of war <coughs> and battle by spending time with the families in Section 60 where the casualties from Afghanistan and Iraq are buried. It has enriched my life more than I can ever say through storytelling. So through storytelling today, I'm alive, I'm lively, and I'm sassy. <laughs> An opportunity through that story to tell it on Memorial Day last year and on Veterans Day at the Women's Military Memorial at Arlington. 
if you haven't been there, they are collecting the histories and the stories of women who have served in the military since the American Revolution, those that have assisted and then those who served. And they've added a whole new category, a new generation of heroes as they record and they exhibit stories of the lives of the new heroes, the young women who are serving in battle along with their brothers today. Veterans Day, I had an just incredible opportunity when I was there to tell my story. Is that the father of one of the young women I mentioned in my story came to hear it. And afterwards, privately, he told me and my family the story of his daughter, who's now a fallen medic, a fallen army medic, and the story of her last battle. I will never forget her story, and more than that, I will never forget the loving father that told it to us. Storytelling is your legacy. It's a way of passing on and an extraordinary way of remembering. That's part of why recently I was invited to come to a local university to a class on, of the arts and military experience. And I was invited to tell my story, my Arlington story, but when I got there and I heard what they were doing, those undergraduates and graduate students were doing, I said, let's put my story on a sideboard over here for later and let me listen to your stories. They are interviewing veterans so that they can pass on first-hand accounts of these guys and women's experience and maybe I could help them with what I know about storytelling to tell their story very effectively because we need to hear these first-hand stories that some of these guys are, and women are bringing back to us. I was privileged to do that. My story could wait. When I teach a workshop, I often start, there you are, with a group of strangers. Nobody knows anybody. And I ask them to, you know, gather around or whatever, and we'll go person by person. Tell me the story of your name. And then I will tell them mine. I'm named for two grandmothers. Two grandmothers. And I tell them about them. And then I say, you know, that I found my grandfather's story. I carry his name. Tell the story of your name. So if there's three things I'd like for you to remember from what I have said today. Number one, your story is your legacy. It's how you'll be remembered. Tell it. Know it and tell it. Second, enrich yourselves by asking for other people's stories. They will be happy to tell them to you. And third, I hope you'll keep in mind the story of our unknown friend here in the album. Think of her. Gather your story and then tell it. And if you're stuck getting started, remember, you can tell them the story of your name. Good luck. Wow.